Hey folks, Sonny Carey here with Campaigns and Elections. Welcome to today's webinar sponsored by Digital Advertising Alliance. Our topic is digital political ads, state disclosure laws, and a new vote for transparency. Uh, we're going to have a formal Q&A session towards the end of the webinar, uh, but please use the questions function to the right of your screen throughout, and we'll do our best to get everyone's questions answered. Uh, we've got five phenomenal speakers who will be taking part in the discussion. Big thanks to each of them for participating in today's webinar. Uh, I'm going to introduce each of them one by one, and we'll get started shortly. Uh, first, we have Chet Dalzell, Vice President of Participant Communications and Engagement at, Na at Digital Advertising Alliance. Uh, we've got Trent Bemis, uh, National Account Director at Digital Advertising Alliance. Uh, Justin Adler Swanberg, Director of Marketplace Quality at Media Math. And Ron Jacobs, uh, Partner and Co-Chair, Political Law Practice at Venable LLP. Chet, I'll go ahead and pass it over to you. Well, thank you, Sonny, and thank you to Campaign and Elections and uh, our esteemed faculty today. We're going to do everything we can in, in within the hour to get you up to speed on all this, all the said topics. And I wanted to give you a little story um, about an icon that could. In 2009, the digital advertising community needed a way to deliver privacy notices in real time on demand to consumers each and every place where uh, digital informa information about a device or about a browsing behavior was being collected in order to serve an ad to a consumer. Not just any ad, but a, a, a relevant ad based on a consumer's own interests and behavior. That program started the Ad Choices program, which is the little blue icon that delivers real-time notice to consumers each and every time they're presented with an ad uh, based on a responsible data collection. Companies, advertisers, publishers, all subscribe and license that icon in order to give the consumer that relevant on-demand notice of privacy information um, the, enabled by that advertiser, publisher, or ad tech company. And it's um, been working hard since 2011. Uh, it's now served globally uh, one and a half trillion times every month, that little blue icon. And that indeed has been a very a great success story. So let's park that privacy discussion and talk about political advertising. Political ads have also come under the spotlight, um, not necessarily for privacy reasons, but because in the election 2016, if you remember, there were very big concerns about nefarious foreign actors uh, possibly buying lookalike ads, making it sound they were throwing the election for one presidential candidate or another, or, or whatever, a House or Senate race, either way. Um, and yet, was that ad really from a bona fide uh, campaign? Was it who was behind that ad? What's behind the curtain? So, well, that's when the political ad icon was born. And the DAA, using the same principles as a privacy program, adopted a set of transparency guidelines for political ads to let voters know, any citizen know, that this ad is a legitimate political ad served to you on behalf of a candidate and uh, running for, at the time, state and federal office. So that is when the political ad program was adopted. Uh, we rolled it out initially in 2018 election cycle, uh, just actually in the spring of that year, and to enable a way for agencies, ad tech companies, excuse me, uh, agencies, uh, political advertisers, and publishers to make sure that uh, a political ad has this transparency vehicle visible. And so our goal has been 
let's get the full entirety of the political ad market in digital and mobile space using this icon. Hence this discussion today. Um, basically, what the transparency requirements are kind of mirror what you see in broadcast media and in direct mail and offline media, but also um, we ripped up. There are a couple state laws that we're going to hear about, and so we took a look at the whole body of transparency requirements, and we put them in the uh, principles. So when you're using the political ad icon, there is a requirement that when you click on that icon connected to the ad, you either have a pop-up or a landing page or some sort of real-time notice given that this is uh, these specific requirements are tied to a disclosure notice to the consumer. So the voter gets to see the name of the political ad, where they're located. Um, if there's a federal or state re additional requirement, um, then that could be delivered. And certainly um, we have also built a, a government database of all the um, links to all the state and federal uh, databases of the government, uh, secretaries of state, election commissions, disclosure commissions at the state level uh, on a voter facing site called aboutpoliticalads.org. And, uh, and then of course, any names of uh, key uh, officers connected to a campaign. So that's what we put forward in 2018. In 2020, we started to see in earnest the icon starting to be used um, on express advocacy ads in the United States. What's an express advocacy ad? An express advocacy ad is an ad that specifically supports one candidate or another who is running for a state or federal office. That was what our focus was in getting the icon out into the marketplace. Um, and we'll, we'll have a, a little bit of a discussion on other types of issue-based ads in a little bit, but I just wanted to let you know our expectation is for express advocacy ads to carry this icon always in digital space. So increasingly though, States, uh, while the Federal Elections Commission, we're going to hear a little bit about, Ron, on what the states and the federal government is doing, but I wanted to certainly let you know that we get pats on the back and we hear from state disclosure commissions about they love what we're trying to do here through this icon and providing this voter transparency in this way. Uh, increasingly, states States are passing some laws that also have requirements of advertisers, political advertisers, campaign advertisers, to uh, make the types of disclosures we spoke about, and um, also to create registries. So we're going to hear a little bit about registries as well in today's discussion. So I will definitely wanted to use this to set the stage of our... Um, an overview that Ron's going to now give us, Ron Jacobs from Venable, and he will give us this uh, state-specific regulatory overview. Thank you, Ron. Great, thanks, Chet, and thanks, everybody. It's great to be with you today to talk about uh, the digital ads requirements. Uh, we'll go to the next slide, please, Chet. Um, so let's start with a quick recap of the federal rules for digital ads. And the good news is there aren't any. Um, or at least there aren't any special ones for digital. The same rules that apply for print ads or for uh, video all apply on the federal side without specific digital rules. So if a campaign wants to buy a banner ad, then the campaign ad needs to include a paid for by the name of the campaign um, box on there, just like it would if it were taking out a newspaper ad from, from years and years ago. Um, all of the requirements are set forth in the Federal Election Commission's regulations. There's no requirement to maintain a database of your ads or anything like that um, at the federal level. So digital federal ads, just think about sort of it, you know, what you would normally do. 
The DAA ICON as a self-regulatory program is used kind of in addition to the federal rules. We're hopeful that at some point in time, the Federal Election Commission will get around to deciding that an ICON could be an effective way of conveying the disclaimer, in particular, given the different sizes of digital ads and the different kinds of um, content, that that will at some point in time be a better solution than trying to put the actual physical disclaimer on there. But the Federal Election Commission is slow to adopt new technology. And so at some point, maybe we'll see a change there. But for now, you have to stick with the original federal rules as well as um, you know, for the self-regulatory program for the DAA. The other thing to remember for the federal rules is that those all apply to the candidates or the campaigns, the PACs, the super PACs, whoever it is that's paying for the ad. There, are, Because there are no federal rules on digital ads, there are no requirements that apply directly to the platforms, the publisher, or the, the platforms, the ad networks, anything like that. It's all on the candidates. So if you're placing ads, selling ads, buying ads from, or, uh, from candidate ads, it's all on the original content where the, all these requirements apply. I say all that and in, in sort of lay out the easy federal rules because as we flip into the different states, you'll see a difference. The state rules take different approaches here. Um, so if we'll go to the next slide, please, Chet. The states have been active. Um, now, particularly they were active right before COVID, I will say. There were a number of states that we'll talk about that were passing new laws that were aimed specifically at digital ads and that specifically looked at the um, the technology um, and the way the ads were delivered so that the requirements are not just on the candidates and the advertisers, but on the platforms um, the ad networks and sort of everybody in between where the rules actually apply. That was a trend that was growing up um, you know, from 2018, 19, and into some of the legislative sessions of 2020. Then COVID hit and they all decided they had more important things to worry about. Um, but I'm anticipating that probably after these midterm elections, we'll probably see some more state laws passed that will um, apply directly to the platforms and others. Um, there are sort of two key components most of these state laws there's the disclaimers on the digital ads which those rules again tend to run toward the candidates but some states impose specific requirements on uh, the platforms to make sure the disclaimers are there or as we'll see in california certain types of ads impose requirements on the platforms then the second trend is has been a database approach um, some of the larger platforms have built databases of political ads. So you can go in and click on candidate X and figure out all the different ads that that candidate has served. The state regulators like that. Um, they think it's a great idea. They don't necessarily appreciate that a closed ecosystem versus an open ecosystem is different in how that works. Um, but some of the states have imposed what we call the database rules. And we'll, we'll, again, we'll kind of unpack that and explain what those mean. The hard part is, is that the disclaimer rules are generally fairly easy to deal with. States, as Chet mentioned, have been pretty big fans of the DAA ICON as a substitute for the full written disclosure and are interested in using the DAA ICON to solve for some of those problems. The database requirements have been a little more difficult to work out. Um, as Chet mentioned, there is a registry component now to the DAA program that may help solve some of those database issues. Um, and so again, just to kind of, in general, we're talking about rules on the advertisers but not always, and I'll try and make clear as we go through some of these state rules um, where the rules apply to um, the platforms as opposed to just the advertisers. So check, we can go to the next slide, please. So there are about seven states that have these different rules, and we'll, we'll go through some of them in a little more detail than others. Um, some of the rules are easy to comply with. Others are not. Um, there are many platforms, many ad networks that will not take political advertising in some of these states that we're talking about because it's very hard to comply with the rules. An important um, distinction that I need to draw here is that when we're talking about state laws for elections, it only applies to state candidates. So someone running for governor or uh, state representative, state senator, attorney general, it doesn't apply to federal candidates. So a candidate running for Senate in California, the US Senate in California, only has to comply with the federal rules. They don't have to comply with the California rules. In contrast, someone who's running for governor in California has to make has to comply with the uh, the gubernatorial rule or the the online um, digital ads rules in California. Similarly, if you are an ad network selling or selling ads, um, 
or I should say buying ads or, uh, or selling your ad space, then you have to figure out who your advertiser is so that that Senate candidate doesn't have to worry about the California rules. You don't have to worry about complying with the California rules for that Senate candidate. But if you're selling rules or selling ads for a gubernatorial candidate in California, then depending on the nature of the ad and how the ad is delivered, it may be subject to the California rules itself, which do apply in certain circumstances to um, platforms. So let me walk through California and, um, you know, California, actually we can go back to the, the last slide for a second. Um, California says that an, an online platform is a public facing internet website, web application, or digital application, including social networks, ad networks, or search engines that sells advertisements directly to advertisers. One of the things that we have been seeing that's good is the sort of sells directly to advertisers language in a lot of laws, which helps with the complicated digital ecosystem where you ha may have many intermediaries involved in the uh, transmission and selling of the, the political ads. Um, and so if you're, if, if someone else sells the ad um, or, it, or buys, it sells the ad space, and then transmits it's on, it's not the end platform, it's the first platform. So in California, if, if you've got an online platform, and we'll go to the next slide, please. Um, and then you have to have not only an online platform, but something called an online platform disclosed advertisement. And only in California can they take so many words to sort of figure out what, what, what is actually even covered by the law. So California, an online platform disclosed advertisement has two different elements. One is this, what I call the social media prong and then the other prong. So the social media prong is if you're a platform and you have a paid electronic media advertisement um, via a form of electronic media that allows users to engage in discourse and post content or other type of social media for which the committee pays the online platform. But if it's not a video, as long as it complies with the video rules, and if, it, um, if it's not in individual posts or comments that are posted without payment, it's the social media prong. So if it's the top paragraph there, but not the other two, it's uh, covered. And then the other prong is what I call the um, any paid electronic media advertisement that is not a graphic image, animated graphic, et cetera, that links through or, or allows a hyperlink back to a website containing the disclosures. So this is kind of, again, California can define things in the negative here. If you have a graph, a banner ad, for example, if you click the ad and it goes back to a website that has all the necessary disclaimers, it's not an online platform disclosed advertisement. But if it's a banner ad that doesn't allow for a click through, then it's an online platform disclosed advertisement that has to comply with the, um, the California rules. So after that long lead up, we now turn to what the rules are. So next slide, please, Chet. So the online platform um, disclaimer set of the rules um, has to include the, a paid for by or an ad paid for by language along with a bunch of other information about the committee. Um, or it has to have a hyperlink that, let, that takes you back to this. So if you remember just from just a second ago, things that you click through and get to a web page, that's the advertiser's responsibility. It's not an online platform disclosed advertisement. You don't have to worry about it. But if it's an online platform disclosed advertisement, then the platform has to provide sort of the link back information, um, the who funded this ad, the paid for by icon. So it's a little confusing, but generally what, what I see most platforms doing is saying, look, we'll take a state political ad in California as long as the ad itself is a click through link to the, the acceptable website, not that, you're, that, the, that the platform itself is going through all of these problems. It depends a little bit and some platforms are more flexible than others, but that's kind of the nature of what you're looking at here. Um, the other thing, and this is where the DAA icon comes into play or can come into play, is that if you do have one of these online platform disclosed advertisements, an icon can work to get you there. And so using the DAA icon and filling in all of the information into the DAA system will allow you generally to build a compliance approach for an online platform disclosed advertisement using the DAA icon. So that's a good example of where the technology that the DAA has built for political ads can be helpful in, in designing a solution to comply with state law. Now, California has a second half to its, um, 
to its law. So we'll go to the next slide, please, Chet. It also has one of these, uh, the records database, um, which I mentioned before that some states are, are creating. Um, if you're an online disclosed platform ad, like we just talked about, then the platform has to maintain this database. So a digital copy of the ad, the name of the candidate or the office sought, uh, the committee that paid in its um, Fair Political Practices Commission ID, um, then it starts to get into some pretty detailed information about the approximate number of impressions generated, uh, the date and time that the advertisement was first and last displayed, the range charged or the total amount spent on the advertisement. So all this information has to be in an online website. And this goes back to the platform um, and the records have to be made available for at least four years. So this gets back to the problem that while you could have an online disclosed platform ad, and solve for the disclaimer part with the DAA icon. If you fall in that category, you then all have to, to build this database component to the California law. The good news is the DAA has now built a registry uh, system that should be able to allow most platforms to, to build out this function if they want to, um, to comply with that part of the rule as well. And so you don't have to kind of contort yourself to get out of the platform rules um, that we just talked about. So all this is important for advertisers, those working with candidates, PACs, et cetera, because it helps to understand what the platforms are facing and why they may say, no, I won't take your ad, or why, if I take your ad, I need to get all of this information or structure it so that we can keep, keep a, a, a database up in California. So those are the California rules. Um, if we go to the next slide, please, Chet, we'll talk a little bit about Maryland. And I promise to run through the next states a little faster. I take California first because it has a law that's kind of encompassed, encompasses everything else that's floating out there in different um, um, areas. So Maryland um, defines online platform, a public facing internet website, web application or digital application, including a social network. It has um, size requirements. So 100,000 unique monthly US visitors um, and it receives payment for qualifying digital communications. So go to the next slide, please. So in, in Maryland, online platforms are required to make sure that their advertisers have the necessary disclaimers, which are generally a paid for by the name and address of the campaign and the treasurer. Um, or it can have an icon that when scrolled over or clicked displays the paid for by information. So this is one of those situations that Chet mentioned where the DAA created its icon, went in and talked to the Maryland Elections um, Enforcement Agency, worked with them to have to help them to develop regulations that would allow icons in particular an icon like the DAA icon while it's not mentioned directly in this the regulations it's clearly contemplated by these and so you can solve the disclaimer side of things with the um uh, with the DAA icon so now uh we'll go to the next slide maryland also has a uh, registry or an online platforms record database rule the status of this law is a little complicated because a bunch of newspaper publishers challenged the law um in federal court and they said that the in the, the court agreed that the statute was unconstitutional as applied to newspapers the state is continuing to enforce it into other kinds of platforms which leads to kind of an odd arrangement and also a situation where um, many platforms are not interested in taking ads in maryland um, or if they are they have designed a platform uh, records database to uh, comply with the rules and as you can see it's a kind of a long list of things um, that are designed to be captured here what I find is that the problem with the, the databases is that it starts to go from simple sort of, um, you know, copies of the ads to the, to the regulators wanting to know more and more information. And then because these are all state laws, the state legislators think, gee, wouldn't it be great if I can figure out what my opponents are doing um, and get all the details. And so they add these, these additional disclosure rules that in many ways are sort of the secret sauce to some of the campaign targeting um, that, we, that we deal with um, and makes things more complicated. Um, so we'll go to the next slide, please. Um, Washington State, again, commercial advertiser def defined. Washington is interesting because while they have some sp specific rules for digital um, content, their law kind of grows on, on, on an old law that's been around since uh, the early 70s. And there's, it's built on a concept of checks and balances where while the candidates have to do a lot of disclosure, the um, 
providers of services to candidates have to keep a bunch of records that are available upon inspection. So if in the old days, if you were a print shop and printed direct mail, you, you were subject to sort of inspection by um, any individual who wanted to see your records about your election direct mail. And so that's spun outward into um, digital advertising as well. So we'll go to the next slide, please. Um, again, the disclaimers in Washington, relatively straightforward. Um, it allows for icons. So again, a great way where the DAA system can be used to comply. Um, but if we go to the next slide, we'll see this sort of um, the commercial advertiser records database requirement where you've got to keep a copy of the ad, all kinds of other information. Um, and you don't have to make it build a database that's available to the public at all times. It's this bizarre requirement where you have to allow some, if someone makes a request to you that you provide the records. So in the digital world, one of the ways that people try to accomplish that is with the with building a database or it's another one of those states where a lot of platforms won't allow um, state political advertisers to advertise because it's so complicated to comply we'll go to the next slide please a couple of other states nevada new jersey and new york kind of round out the states with specific digital rules um, nevada again has sort of a uh, record keeping requirement very similar to the washington requirement also complicated to deal with, um, but can be done. Um, New Jersey, similar situation where the uh, um, uh, the platforms have to maintain the records of the transactions involving their political advertising activity. And then New York has a very narrow rule. And this gets back to something Chet said about sort of legitimate ads and who's paying for the ads. New York basically has a screening function. So if you're a platform taking political advertising in New York and an independent expenditure committee, which is a, the fancy term for super PAC, wants to take out ads in New York, they have to provide their statement of organization to the platform, which has to kind of verify to make sure that it's actually an independent expenditure committee that's registered and disclosing their information. So it's kind of a gatekeeping function. So those are all the different state rules that um, come into play. Like I said, it's you know seven states right now. I anticipate probably a growing trend. Um, and unlike the federal rules, which apply you know to the advertisements, sort of media neutral and apply to the candidates and advertisers, these state rules reach sort of around to get to the platforms and the ad networks as well. Um, so just as the quick uh, final summary, um, again disclaimers. Generally, those disclaimer requirements are going to fall on the advertiser, but there, sometimes the states have rules with the platforms that have to ensure compliance. And then the platforms, not the advertisers, generally face these record retention or database requirements that the DAA uh, platform um, can, can help to address. Hi, uh, thanks for that, Ron. Uh, in Canada, uh, Elections Canada, our federal body, agrees that if the place where the identification information is obvious from the face of the ad and it can be accessed through a click or a hover over icon, that will meet the requirement that the identification information is included in or on the message. Uh, of course, the icon has to be visible and that's part of our guidelines as well. You can put it on any corner uh, and things like that. Next slide. We went a step further and went to our largest province, Ontario, and they approve the icon and they even went one step further and actually on the wording. So if you want to go to the next slide, Chet, um, we have all kinds of wording that's acceptable ad marker text in Canada. It can be authorized by disclosure, ad info, um, you know, paid for by, and you know, who funded this. It depends on if it's a direct political candidate, if it's a third party candidate, like an issue based, and also how close it is to the election itself. So some of these uh, are authorized, but by working with the regulators, the DAA has really, really made it easy for the agencies and the candidates to really express with the icon all kinds of different verbiage. Thanks. Next. Trent, before we go to Media Math next, I just wanted to say thank you because of our. Uh, cousins in Canada, the Digital Advertising Alliance of Canada. Uh, we definitely worked uh, very closely all the time and um, we've used uh, the good head start that Canada did in building our own political platform 
political ad platform that we're going to be in, um, detailing shortly. So I just wanted to publicly acknowledge our cousins up north and say thank you. We both care about voter transparency, and it's clear in what we're both doing. And um, and uh, next, I'd like to bring in Justin from Media Math because they operate in both jurisdictions of the United States and Canada. And uh, I'll turn it over to uh, Justin. Thank you. Thanks, Chet. So uh, as a demand side platform, uh, we service many different advertisers who are, who are placing ads um, on all kinds of uh, media, open web, um, in-app inventory, um, OTT, CTV inventory, um, all, all kinds of inv ad inventory across many different channels. And um, we made a decision some time ago that we would support political advertising, um, but we wanted to make sure uh, that we were supporting all of the necessary sort of compliance uh, background. So, um, you know, one of the things that Media Math has aligned to some time ago also is transparency and accountability. Um, we support the DAA, DAAC guidelines. Um, it's included in our user policy that, that anybody who wants to use our platform also has to adhere to, to those, um, those guidelines. And we do acknowledge, um, you know, as Ron was saying, that m most of the onus is on the advertiser um, to support it, although as a platform, we have some, some obligations. Um, but our, our goal is really about uh, you know, because the advertisers are our clients, how do we facilitate this in a, in a, a really easy to support fashion? And, and what we found is that the DA's uh, political icon uh, platform is really quite easy to use. And, and we've set it up in a way so that there's really a, a fairly minimal lift um, for our uh, clients. So I've included some screenshots here just so you can see what it is that, that we require. It's a little bit um, small, but it's really quite simple. Um, we have an intake form that we ask folks to fill out that just gives us some background information on the advertiser, um, some of the contact information, uh, their, you know, where they're serving the ads, their understanding of their compliance obligations, et cetera, um, since it is their responsibility to comply. Um, and then we ask them to fill out a, a fairly simple spreadsheet that really sort of plugs in very directly to uh, the uh, DA's uh, Purple Icon platform. Um, once they provide that to us, uh, it's really simple. We upload the form to the platform, and then the, there's a little box that's highlighted down there. It says political campaign. They just have to check that, and that's pretty much it. That means that any time a campaign gets served uh, from the advertiser that has been identified on the spreadsheet uh, in the platform, um, any of the campaigns that are associated with that advertiser are going to automatically get the purple political icon applied. Um, you want to go to the next slide, Chet? Um, so, you know, this is just to give you a, a, an idea of how, how easy it is. It's really, you know, there's, there's what, I think seven or eight, seven required fields that they have to fill out. Um, there's, there's a couple of encouraged ones where we want them to have, um, at least one of the, the major contact ones, website, mailing address, or phone. Um, they have the option of putting in financial disclosures. Um, and then, you know, it, it, then we upload it to the, to the platform. And then go on, Chad, if you don't mind. And then, of course, here, when we give folks guidance on how to implement uh, political ads, uh, we describe certain obligations they have regarding targeting, uh, regarding the content of the ads and then also we highlight uh, the responsibility of adhering to the DAA and DAAC principles. We link out to those principles so that folks can look them up. We encourage our advertisers to familiarize themselves. Um, you know, it becomes important, particularly when you're talking about Canada with issues-based advertising. They need to understand the differences, you know, where, where those ads do or don't fall into the requirements. Um, and, you know, the, it's really been, uh, incredibly simple. I think, you know, my experience working with advertisers, generally, they find it fairly easy to implement. And we're very eager to see what the developments are that the DAA does to support some of these regulatory requirements. 
you know, we are one of those platforms that has been historically a little reticent to go into some of these environments like Washington State that have these very specific requirements. So to the degree that um, the DA's platform can build toward that direction, it would be great. And, um, you know, there's other pieces, like there's a, there's a, this is the great value add piece, which I don't think people are aware of about being able to build out surveys and things like that. So it, it, it's not just, um, you know, a requirement, it's, it's actually supportive of uh, a lot of elements of political advertising. So we're, we're pretty, um, you know, positive about the whole thing and found it to be a great support to our political ads business. Hey, I, I want to say thank you to Media Map and, um, they're just a, one of a number of ad tech companies who have been transparency heroes, uh, both on the privacy front and certainly in the election area. So it's uh, uh, what they did when they took the when the DAA principles were first uh, enacted for political advertising transparency. They took it in earnest to find the way to make uh, this process easy for campaigns to to uh, jump on and comply with. And, you know, we really, our goal in introducing a platform this year, uh, in, or, or shall I say reintroduce it to the entirety of the marketplace, is to make it easy for a small campaign, an ad agency with multiple campaign clients, uh, trying to find ways to enable them to make this, you know, Voter transparency, check. And so for the next 10 minutes, I'm gonna let Trent do a little bit of sizzle and show and tell as he does uh, on how the platform works. And uh, we'll, we'll wrap it up with how you can get engaged with it. So I will hand things over to my able colleague, Trent. Thanks a lot, Jet. Um, my name's Trent Pemis and I'm excited to be here um, because I know firsthand how much work is involved in political campaigns versus regular campaigns. Um, my background in digital media, and these tools that we have are going to are really designed for agency life, and they're going to save you time, money, headache, uh, make your clients happy, and most importantly, look good. So, next slide. So, what does the platform create for you? It really creates three uh, elements, and the first one is the icon itself. And that can have different uh, uh, nomenclature. You can put it on different corners. Uh, it creates the rollover on the right, you see, that has you know, uh, links to your website, has full transparency details. This one actually has a survey. And if you click on that full tr uh, transparency details, you go to the next slide, Jet, you'll see that it actually builds the actual uh, click-through page itself that has all the required information, uh, has any OBA information on it, and the system creates a, a piece of code to create all this. The ad marker code is real similar to your ad choices uh, code, and you can serve the icon along your ads however you're trafficking already. Uh, the code works programmatically, in direct media buys, you know, display ads, mobile, uh, video ads, and things like that. So it's very familiar to traffickers. They, oh, this is just like ad choices, very similar. Uh, next, the uh, so like Justin had talked about, you enter the criteria, you enter the criteria once. The similar criteria that Justin was talking about that he does on his end, same thing you would enter on the platform, uh, contact information and such. It's very interesting that if they're very similar on both sides of the border, almost identical, actually around the world, everybody wants to know the same types of criteria. Different states have some extra criteria, but the base is the same for everyone. Jet? Again, the tech builds all this, builds your landing pages. You can manage multiple clients and, and handle this. It's really designed for agencies. It's very quick. Uh, next, Jet. What I like, some of the uh, functions from Agency Life, it saves on production. And when you're not writing the disclaimer message all over the creative, you can create new sizes very easily. So you can resize the creative to the right size that you need put the disclaimer icon, the transparency icon rather, on any one of the corners that suits the creative size best, and now you can send that off to your client for approval, it's all ready to go. Next. We added a rollover survey feature to add a little bit of stickiness. 
We can see who's opening the surveys. Again, that survey question also gets put onto your transparency uh, page details as well. Next. Now my favorite is for the reporting function. And we take the log file of the icon and, it, and we can make great heat maps of where your ad actually was served on a map. So we don't know anything about the performance of the ad. We don't even know the ad itself. We just know where the ad was served. And this is a great tool uh, for reporting. Here's where your money was spent. Here's where the performance is. Next slide. And we make those maps with an Excel sheet of where your impressions are. And then we can lay it over whatever kind of uh, jurisdiction map. I and mean, in Canada, we have federal ridings, provincial ridings, states have state counties, they have all different jurisdictions, there's federal uh, jurisdictions. Whatever the election is, we're gonna overlay that in Excel so you can see the state, county, the jurisdiction, the city, the impressions and things like that. Well, that's something that uh, you can give back to your clients. And the most important, uh, our new feature that uh, I know that uh, we're all excited about is really the ad registry uh, for transparency. And we have the ways that we can load up all kinds of our criteria, the impression count, campaign cost, who funded. We can make the tools, and we have the tools, to put all the criteria that be in there. Um, we need people to fill it out properly, uh, but we have the tools for it. So it's interesting, Chad, I'd love to get in to, to speak on this is that the, whether you want it for a publisher or you want it for a uh, candidate, they all kind of want the same type of information. Yes, uh, thank you, Trent. And I'll tell you, when you are uh, creating these, uh, one of the reasons why we love having Ron Jacobs and our Venable team around and leaning in is because we want to make sure that as we uh, build fields and ask agencies and campaigns for the fields that we're asking for it's because there's a state there's a state regulator that wants to know that or uh you know it might not apply to every jurisdiction but you know these things aren't just there for uh to be uh yes some of the basics are part of our self-regulatory nature but don't forget we're always requiring that you uh, include all the state required state and federal disclosures as well. And so if a state asks for uh, expenditure data, um, you know, even if it's range or estimated, you you put it in there. Um, that might not apply to every other state you're, you're uploading for, but it is certainly uh, something that we try to uh, uh, make sure that the platform is, uh, is, is helping the campaign and publisher or agency comply. And I might also say we built it uh, to Trent's point is being app and dexterous. So it, it, it works for a publisher, it works for an adver the advertiser, the campaign itself, um, and then any agency that's uh, serving either. So it's basically uh, trying to uh, make, make it easy for the uh, for a campaign to comply and also, in, indeed, make it easy for the voter to understand uh, who's behind an ad. And uh, so that's kind of where it's at. Um, I certainly want you guys to understand that uh, this is a new offering. And um, it, basically, what we require of any campaign is that they uh, license the icon that goes with the political ad marker and that they do so in a way uh, it's, it's actually, uh, there's actually two agreements involved. One is free. We, we live in a democracy, uh, political voter transparency ought to be free, you know, vote. <laughs> so we have a, an ad marker license agreement that is required. It's a no cost, but once you sign the click wrap agreement, that's stating your intent, you're to adhere to the DAA transparency principles. And also you're agreeing to be, uh, how should I say, subject to enforcement. DAA actually relies on two independent organizations, the BBB national programs, that's the Better Business Bureau's national programs, um, and the Association of National Advertisers uh, Center for Ethical Advertising 
those both enforce our political advertising agreements. And so um, this is a, uh, we would just want folks to know that even though there's a state regulator on the beat, there's also an independent enforcement arm of, uh, they, they work, op they operate independent of DAA, but they are important to us. Um, so once you sign that agreement, we deliver the icon asset to you with the instructions, the creative instructions on how to use it in the United States. We also enable that, um, I don't have it on this particular slide, but you can also let us know that your intent to support a Canadian client or Canadian advertiser, we can make that connection happen for you. And second is a, in a, a, an addendum an agree to the ICON agreement that will enable you to use the, uh, uh, the platform and the registry program. Uh, those are optional additions, they're add-ons, and they're at very low cost. If you go back to that license page, we have some of that pricing information posted there for you. But it, it's basically, um, we're not hung up on getting as many click wrap agreements and signed and the legal agreements as signed as possible right now. Right now, we just want people to use the icon and program. So uh, between Trent and myself and our Canadian friends, we're going to be uh, doing as much onboarding as we can. Um, we already have the support of Justin and the media maths of the world who are also doing that for their clients. So if you're working with DSPs, ad tech companies directly or others, uh, you should make sure they're enabling this for you. So with that, I think we can now uh, use our last uh, 15 minutes or so to take some questions from the audience. Sonny, do we have any? Thank you, Chet. Uh, so just a reminder to everybody in the audience, uh, on the bottom right of your screen, you will see a questions tab right there. Go ahead and post anything you want to ask uh, to our speakers through there, and I'll make sure we get it answered. Uh, in the meantime, I do have a couple of quick ones uh, on my own, and uh, up to uh, all of you uh, on the panel, uh, if one of you wants to take it or you want to you know, have multiple folks uh, take a stab at it. So just to kind of start off, um, are there uh, some good examples of political ad registries which currently exist either in the U.S. or Canada? Trent, I'll let you take a, a good stab at that because I know you've been doing a lot of research on that one. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I will about this. I'll put on my Canada hat. Yes, the, the, on the uh, Canadian uh, political ads website, uh, our uh, Canadian site, we have links to different registries. And some of the publishers there do a good job because they had to. We have some major publishers there. I know, you know, CBC and things like that. I said there were some other ones there. And they really show good examples. And we're going to mail this to everybody of how they did it and what I think is exciting about it. But if you can see the creative, you can see the ad spend. Some do it by election year, I think is a great way to sort. Um, others by candidates and a combination. So I'm going to send links out to everybody uh, as a follow up to say these are the ones that I thought were good examples. They were publisher focused. But again, all the information could be for the candidate or for the publisher as well. You know, Trent, it's funny you brought that up because when I looked at our own building, our own platform out, I did take a peek at politicalads.ca for Canada. And I right. think that's where there are some feet. If you scroll down, I think you definitely see some of the uh, most popular Canadian registries. But I have to say, even on the, on the state side, I've, I want to say I've had a mi mixed result on how good I think they are. I mean, just to be blunt, they can be better. But uh, that's why I love our program, because we're really building it in a way that gives, oh, my gosh, this is exactly what regulators want. This is kind of the expectations. And, you know, going back to Federal Elections Commission, these are the types of disclosures and uh, disclaimers, et cetera, that are, are asked for and required in political ads in general. So uh, the fact that we have some additional requirements in digital is good because we built it into our platform. And uh, so thanks for that question, Sonny. Yeah, and, and Sonny, along with it, I saw a question pop up that I was gonna say something else before I turned it over to Justin. What I wanted to say is that we have right now political ad and the icon for express advocacy, but if you have other 
requirements and you saw some of the Canadian ones that, you know, paid for by or things like that that you think are, you know, would work best for your state and your campaigns, please let us know. Um, we're, we're definitely here to help. We're pretty agnostic media wise, candidate wise, all that. We just want it, uh, transparency. So I would definitely uh, work with anybody that needs that. Just contact us. Thanks. Great. Thank you, uh, Trent and Chet. Uh, so my next question, has anybody used uh, the political program uh, you guys are speaking about in the USA already? I can speak. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, uh, well, I'm going to speak in two ways. One, I gave, I think if you're earlier on the presentation, I had some examples from the, the most recent elections cycle. Um, I don't have examples from the current primary season yet to, because I don't have necessarily the, uh, uh, it's usually an after the fact that I'm getting the results back from folks. Um, but um, already we've had dozens of ad tech companies who are uh, in, enabling the political ad to be delivered uh, for their particular particular political clients. So yes, that is happening now. Um, am I telling you that I can go get millions of, I know there's millions of impressions. So uh, yeah, from, the, from served, the platform. Yeah, we've served close to 4 billion impressions through the platform the last few years. I'm, I'm pretty sure uh, if I got it right. So yeah, it's, it's, it's out there. Uh, the new, the new features, the mapping and the surveys and things like that, that's new. But for Adcon itself, yeah, there's we're in the billions. I mean, we're using it, so yeah. you know, <laughs> we're, we're using it in the U.S. Yeah, no guinea pigs. We've been testing this. Don't worry. <laughs> yeah, uh, I mean, I just, I just have uploaded recently some some new data to the the, the platform for for new advertisers that are that are going. So it, it's an ongoing thing that we're using. Great. And just to follow up on that, so what are the uh, the costs to use the uh, platform and program? Uh, are there contracts and minimums? Uh, Trent, I can give you the, the I'll, I'll let you, I'll just let everyone know how we set this up is there is an, um, first of all, again, for the icon itself to license and use, there's a zero charge. But for the platform, we charge basically based on um, a usage fee for how how many ads are being served with the icon on a cost per thousand basis. Um, there is an onboarding fee just to get the initial setup going. Uh, I mean, these are like digital dimes, so it's not uh, terribly expensive. And then um, we also have a storage we have some storage costs connected to the registry. So we do have a uh, annual fee connected to the registry. But we're talking all of this combined, probably just a couple thousand dollars. And um, of course the usage fees vary depending on how many clients you have, how many, uh, is it a, you know, a large state campaign? Is it a small state campaign? Um, and yeah, we, how, yeah, yeah, we do a straight, um, I, I, I get laughed at a lot of when they ask about pricing because I get so passionate and they're like, you don't, you charge a 25 cent CPM for everything, full service. Like, Trent, why do you get so excited about something that's a rounding error to people? I'm like, I know, but I get excited. It's transparency. <laughs> so, um, and I know that coming from the digital agency, if this came from a large supplier, uh, not a not-for-profit, you would add as, you know, 20 times the price, the type of thing. So it's a, uh, uh, people laugh at me that I get so passionate when it doesn't cost anything I and mean, it saves you on the art, you pay for it right away. So yes, it's a funny question that I get asked a lot, but we are a small item, not a rounding error. Well, we're a rounding error. Yeah. I mean, we're also a self-regulatory organization, which is a not-for-profit organization. Mm -hmm. That's our, what I love. Our goal is for voter transparency here. And our goal in, in asking for revenue even as small as it is is to help cover our costs for supporting and enabling that voter transparency great thank you both um and so how do increased uh transparency regulations help campaigns get a better sense of uh how their money was spent by dsps can you tell me about the exact kind of benefits there Well, I, can I make, I don't think the goal of state regulation or state political transparency is about 
better <clears throat> there might be some benefits accrued from from this but the, the idea of states passing regulations here isn't to help demonstrate the ROI of a political ad it's to enable transparency to the voter um, I'm, perhaps I'm being a little naive but I think that's really what it's all about and I believe in that mission so um, uh, you know Trent and Justin if you want to add to you know heck you know this is what I can I, I can give you this much though our there's a little truth telling in our program right and Trent can tell you all the time about hey listen when I'm doing the mapping I know when you know maybe this ad was saying it, it focused on New Hampshire but gee how did all these Colorado impressions show up so there might be some truth telling there a little bit but uh, if anyone else wants to expand on that point please do yeah I, I would I would say that I don't I don't see this icon as being specifically for that purpose as you were saying i think it's to your point more about transparency to the voter but as a platform we focus on transparency in general so we have other tools available for our clients to be able to get transparency into their roi and you know even things like where's the impression being delivered it's great that the um the political icon has some 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 data that can help back that up but you know it is it is primarily a voter transparency tool as you say. Yeah, it, it verifies some third party that, you know, great suppliers, you know, the, the numbers are, they deliver where they're supposed to do. Um, but it's really, I think, helps the user experience. It cleans up the ad. It has the transparency right there. It can really focus on the message. I, I always thought it was a great, it helped the user experience itself because the chicken scratch of disclosure, I kind of lost track of whatever they're trying to say. I was running right over to the chicken scratch saying, what is this paper? What's it all about? So I don't even know if I have absorbed the message. Uh, so I think this is going to help as a general user experience, just so you can see what the messages are trying to say. Great. Thank you, guys. Uh, and one more question that I had. Uh, so I know you spoke a bit about this earlier throughout the presentation, but just wanted to kind of hammer it in again. Uh, what are some regulations that are not currently mandated federally, uh, but would help stabilize transparency expectations if they were implemented uh, in every state? So I think um, it's a good question. And I think, you know, part of the problem with the state laws is the variability of them and how different they are. Obviously, state elections are subject to state law. And so there's not going to be a federal rule that preempts state campaign laws. I think if states sort of come to a consensus on things like the icon uh, or the usability of an icon, um, and if there are database requirements, if they sort of coalesce around a certain set of elements, that makes things easier for um, platforms to accept advertising around the country. Um, I think it would be wonderful if the Federal Election Commission would recognize that in digital ads, the icon could be as effective or more effective than an actual printed disclaimer, given the size constraints, the changing sizes of digital ads, the different media formats, uh, you know, a, a, uh, an ad that's on your phone versus on your computer screen versus your streaming service, the icon could be helpful um, and, and, and simplify that. And so I would love to see the FEC say that we can use an icon with the, you know, the, the hit satisfies the DAAs, that includes the DAAs concepts to, to allow advertisers to, to develop a simple way to do that. I think that'd be fantastic. Um, and wouldn't necessarily solve the state by state problem would solve the problem for federal candidates um, of having an easy solution. Uh, Sonny, you know, this is why we created this program was to, uh, one, uh, I don't want to say uh, head off a patchwork of state laws. You're going to have states as they would and should uh, manage their own state elections. That's part of our constitutional uh, system in America. Um, and echoing Ron's point, you know, yeah, it'd be great if the federal elections commission could say, hey, it's the 21st century. There's digital advertising. It's delivered this way. Here's a way to, we, we in DAA have built this program to enable this type of transparency. And I don't, you know, if you look at political ad transparency as a compliance concern, I get it. You know, it would be nice to have one set of rules for everybody. Well, those one set of rules are kind of built into our program now. And why not do the right thing by the voter by enabling and adhering to DAA principles for political 
at transparency. Check, check, check. You're you're really doing the right thing, and uh, you're probably doing the lion's share of lifting with uh, complying with any state laws that now exist. Great. Thank you all. Appreciate it. Uh, and big thanks to Digital Advertising Alliance for sponsoring today's webinar. And of course, again, a uh, big thank you to all of our wonderful uh, speakers who joined today. Uh, to our audience, thanks for attending, and we hope to see you next time. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.